Well, good morning again to you. It's, it's really good to be back and to see you all. Um, I mean, there were times where I couldn't even watch you on, you know, online, and so I missed a lot of church. Uh, just gave me more time to talk to God, but, uh, but having the assembly of believers, and I was talking to somebody the other day who said they love it online, and in fact, our, our aunt, we saw her, she's in College Station, and uh, she said that uh, she hopes that her church continues with online worship. Because there are days when she just can't get out. She's 88, and she said, you know, I, but, but when I take communion at home, I'm taking it with the whole congregation. And she was describing exactly what we've been doing here. And so it was very, very, uh, it, was, it was really uh, affirming. And uh, it's been an interesting uh, a couple of weeks for we, me, my, my sister, and her husband, my brother-in-law, Kevin. Um, they're still here. Um, well, what happened was they were supposed to go home, I don't know, a week ago, and um, they missed their flight. But did you know, did you know, how many of you know that Austin has a main airport and then they have a terminal 20 minutes away? How many of you know that? Okay, not too many. Not too many. Did you find out by accident? Was it trial and error? That's how I found out. Anyway, that's how they found out. So they missed their flight, called me up and asked if they'd come back. So I let them for, it was a reduced rate. And, um, <laughs> And then I took them, or they went to the airport yesterday, and, and then Kevin calls up again and says, uh, our flight's been canceled. I said, nah, you're just kidding. I know. Just, he says, no, really, Denver's snowed in. They, don't, they aren't letting any flights into the Denver airport. So here they are again. But, but you know what's really cool about it? I, I mean, I actually asked God. I said, you know what? If they can stay longer, I really want that. So, you know, sometimes... My will and his match up. Not very often, but sometimes it does. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I'm kind of curious because there's a lot of stuff going on right now in our community. I think good stuff, um, especially with the COVID. I mean, I, I pray it's the breakthrough we're all hoping for. But I, I, so here's, here's my question. Since the COVID vaccines have come out, since there's been such a drop in, in cases and hospitalizations, and there are, and, and deaths, and, and since Governor Abbott opened up the state 100%, not saying, I mean, taking away the mandate to wear masks and social distancing, not saying don't wear masks and don't social distance, but making it your choice, making it our choice. Um, since all that came about, what kinds of things have changed? Have you noticed anything that's changed out there, like maybe in our community, Cedar Park, Leander, and so forth and all that, or, or in our church, or maybe in your life? So I, I, let me just share some observations. I got to tell you, when it comes to community, I have seen more traffic here than I have in a year. How about you? I mean, I mean seriously, I'm always just getting caught up in traffic now, but that's a positive thing. I, I like that. And in our church... Well, we've had more physically attend um, this week in the last two weeks than, than we've had in a long, long time. And, and at, Le, at Leona's memorial service, it was like double that. Um, so that was, that was pretty, pretty cool. But what about you? And, you know, that, so with all these changes, are, are you still kind of scared about getting COVID? And you don't have to answer that to me. I just, I know some are, and... I am too. I mean, ironically, the only thing I, I shouldn't be able to get is COVID, but my antibodies are going to wear out, you know, and I, or wear off, and so I, I need to get vaccine, and I haven't been able to yet, and, um, and so I, I, I can, I can see, see that. I don't want to wish it on anybody, because I got it, and I, I know what it's like. It's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult if, if you just happen to be, you know, that small percentage of people that COVID really likes. How about getting the vaccine? How many of you have gotten the vaccine? You got it. How many of you are uncertain? Anybody here uncertain about getting the vaccine? I mean, I've had a lot of home health people come, and they, they, tell, me, they tell me all these horror stories. <laughs> they're supposed to be, like, lifting me up. But anyway, they, they say, I mean, you know, like, this person this, got sick, this person this, this person that. So, yeah, it, you know, it can make you a little uncertain. I, I get that, too. And, and you know what I've learned is, bottom line is, I don't know. And the only one I can trust and you can trust is God. I mean, that, that's it. This is, this is too far out there. We don't know enough about it and maybe never will. But the bottom line is we should always be trusting God anyway. Um, that doesn't mean we get foolish. It doesn't mean we don't, we don't be safe, all right? Um, but ultimately, it's on God. 
and he promises to work it all for our good. But something else I, I want to I wanna tell you, what I've seen since the vaccines came out and Abbott lifted the, the mandate to give it our choice, I have seen, I've seen people, more people than I've ever seen. I, I have seen positivity. I've heard positive comments. I mean, it seems like just people are more, well, they're more excited, you know, about being alive and getting out of the house and things like that. But I've also seen more parties, lots of parties. I mean, dinner parties, birthday parties, parties just because you can have a party, you know. And and the, the, the one I, I, I mean, I've seen some parties that are pretty crazy and, and heard about them. And, and a lot of you know the one I'm going to tell you about because I've, I've, I've told a lot of you it was really, really crazy. I mean, a crazy party. And I don't think, um, I also don't think there could be a celebration any crazier, any wilder than, 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 than this one. Especially when everyone at this party knew exactly what they were celebrating. They were all on the same page and the place was packed and the music was so loud I mean, and the dancing was, was crazy, and the booze was flowing, and the kinds of things going over there in the dark recesses of this very large, you know, room. Well, I'm not even going to tell you what was happening, but let's just call it freedom of expression. And um, when, the, when the guy who was throwing the party, the, the, the host of the party, got up, to, got up to speak, I mean, everyone went nuts. I mean, it was like he was this hero, and, it just, and, and the shot. He had to wait 10 minutes before he could even talk because he'd never been heard because they were just so excited to see him up there. It was that wild. And things didn't slow down. I mean, people kept coming and coming and coming. It went all night, all in the early morning hours, and people coming and yelling and shouting and, and, and drinking and laughing and dancing. It was nuts. And then, and then this happened. Th this happened. The host of this party was on the stage just kind of talking to the people, yucking it up and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, someone came up to the stage, someone that looked, <laughs> looked a lot better than you should look uh, in the early morning hours. He looked wide awake. And he just comes up to the host and just whispered something into the host's ear. And whatever it was he had said, you could see the impact on this guy's face. All of a sudden, Boom. I mean, he was just absolutely devastated. Two guys had to hold him up to keep him from crumbling to the floor. It was that bad. And everything stopped. The music stopped. The dancing stopped. The laughing stopped. Everything came to a halt. You, 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 couldn't, you couldn't miss it. Just like that. And then the sun. You start seeing the sun coming through the windows. It was Sunday morning. And that party in hell was over. That's how the Bible describes it. Well, not exactly like that. I just, I just like to embellish a little bit because I want to paint a picture. Because I've always believed, ever since I was a little kid, you know, when it, when it tells us that he triumphed over evil, made a public spectacle of them, you know, I'm like, they had to be celebrating, just like you said, Seth. He had to think he had a one. Jesus is dead. I got the victory. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. And everything changed. Absolutely everything changed. He didn't win. He got crushed. And that's when he knew it. And that party was over. How many of you, um, how many of you are football fans? How many of you are Dallas Cowboy football fans? Seriously, that's it. I'm, I'm sorry, Pastor Stephen. How many of you are Vikings fans? Okay, there were fewer Vikings fans, <laughs> but, not, but not many. All right, Green Bay fans? You were right, you were right. Well, anyway, we're going to talk about Dallas Cowboys. We'll see if anybody knows the answer to this question. All right, anybody know who... The quarterback was in the 1960s. He became a starter in 1965 for the Dallas Cowboys. Who said that? All right. Don Meredith. Don Meredith. And then he became an announcer for Monday Night Football. Right? And he had the signature close, right? The signature close whenever the, he knew the team, he knew it was over, man, because it was too lopsided. The other team couldn't come back, and he'd always sing a song. Anybody know what that song was? Well, let's sing it. Turn out the lights, the party's over. Keep going, Rick. Things. Oh, keep going. 
I mean, I, I had to make up a Texas draw and couldn't do it. You just got one. That was Don Meredith all the way. Willie Nelson sang it, but I don't think he wrote it. Well, anyway, uh, the point is, <laughs> anyway, that's right. They do. All good things must come to, a, to an end. And, 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 and I just, I thought of that thinking, you know what? What seemed like a victory, what seemed like a, a, a victory to, to, it was SoCal, right? Southern California, USC? No? Cal, California, yeah, just changes around, flips on you like you said. The death of Jesus on that cross was Satan's greatest victory until he rose. <laughs> That's why I think we say again in the Apostles' Creed because his first, his first resurrection, not out of the grave, but when he descended into hell, that's what he had to do. Go down there and let them know. So how does God really describe it? Well, I kind of said it in this verse, Colossians 2.15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, which is so important. If you think of the evil forces, you know, the spiritual evil forces in, in, in the heavens above, I mean, Jesus disarmed them. They can't hurt you. Satan or his minions. Goes on to say, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. By the cross. This is week three in our series called Cross Perspective. And we're looking at the cross from five different points of view. What it meant to God, what it meant to Jesus, what it meant and means to Satan, what it means to the world, and what it means to the church. Well, today we're going to kind of wrap our minds around what it means to Satan. But I, I want to say this. Satan is a creature really hard for us to wrap our mind around him. And, and you know why I think that is? You know, about his reality? I mean, we know about his, his evilness and all that, but when I was a kid, that's not how I saw him. This is, let's put a first picture up first. This is how I saw him. Does that frighten you? I thought, I thought, you know, Satan could be a buddy or something. Then they toughed him up a little bit, you know, beefed him up a little bit, but they still kept him as a kid. I mean, you could still do a timeout, you know. And, and now they got the show called Lucifer where the guy does, I mean, he's actually kind of a handsome guy, just the black wings in the background, but, uh, and he does good in, in the show. And so it's like what you see from Hollywood, what you see from Disney and all that about Satan, well, no wonder most of the, of the world believes he's just a symbol. And, 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 and not, a, not a reality. In fact, according to a survey group called Barna, um, some of you are familiar with this group, they, they, uh, they survey Christians and non-Christians, but they say the majority of Christians do not believe that, that Satan, or the devil, is actually real, actually exists. However, according to an AP News poll, check this out, 97% of Christians believe in the existence of angels. And I find that ironic, considering Satan is a, an angel, right? I mean, he's just a bad one. He rebelled against God. Here's the deal. He's an angel. He's a creature. He is a creation of God. He is not the opposite of God. He is not as supreme as God, as evil as God is good. There is no contest. And that's why when you really read the book of Revelation, the Armageddon is Jesus shows up on a white horse and there's not a battle. Because <laughs> nobody can stand against him. I think, that's an, I think that's an important piece to remember. You know, but, but, but the deal was the angels originally had free will. God took it away. But before he took it away, you had Lucifer, the most powerful, the most beautiful angel, um, the morning star, you know, he rebelled against God. Why? Because in his pride, he wanted to be worshipped as God was. He wanted to be God. That, that's, that's what this party was all about. He was celebrating his freedom from getting out from under the control of God the Father Almighty. That's what this is all about, the authority of God. And now the world has to worship him as their God. That's what he wanted, and which is why he rebels. He convinces a third of the angels to follow his lead. A third of the angels. So Michael, an archangel of God, and you get this in the context when you read scripture, he went to battle against the evil angels with the good angels and the good one. And what happens to, to Satan and his minions? They got cast down from heaven. Legions upon legions of angels. This all happened sometime between day one and day six of creation. How do we know that? Because it had to have happened before what took place in the garden. Right? Before biting of the apple, right? See, 
Satan wasn't finished in his rebellion against God. So he takes on the form of a snake and he convinces Eve to eat from the tree that they're not supposed to, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because Satan promised her that you're going to be just like God, which was actually partly true. They were going to know good and evil, especially evil, disobedience to God. But the part that wasn't true was when Satan told them, you'll never die. Oh, no, you're going to die. In fact, as their descendants, so will we to this life, to this life. That is the moment in time, by the way, when death and decay entered the world. That's when it all began because of sin. So what was needed is a solution to the problem, right? And so God the Father, knowing he did not create humans to die, he created Adam and Eve to live forever. He didn't create plants to die. He didn't create decay, anything like that. It was all to live forever. He did not create people to, sim to die and then simply vanish. <laughs> like a lot of people believe that. Oh, once they die, there's nothing. Oh, no. We have been built and should know that inherently, that we are here forever from the time we are conceived in the womb. We live forever. That's what it's all about. And so God has got to fix this issue now that's going on because the meaning of death right now is we're all going to die and go to hell. So what he does is he has to balance out the punishment for sin that's required, which is what? Death. And he has to balance that out with perfect obedience, which you and I can't do. And then he had to make both those things, the punishment for sin and perfection, righteousness, count for the human race. So what God does through the cursing of Satan, which I think is just absolutely amazing how he does this, is he makes this promise in Genesis 3.15. This is the very first gospel. It's not in the New Testament. By the way, the New Testament isn't the gospel, and the Old Testament is the law. There's gospel throughout the Bible. There's also law throughout the Bible, but the first gospel is Genesis 3.15. God says, I will put enmity or hostility, Satan, between you and the woman, between your seed and hers, and he will crush your head, and he will bruise you. And you will bruise his heel. And where did that happen? On the cross. On the cross. I want to read something to you from the Gospel of John. John chapter, chapter 12, 27 through 33. I, I, was, I didn't plan on using this, but as I was putting this together, I fell on this section of Scripture where Jesus has predicted his death. He's got a crowd of people around him as he's talking here. And here's what he says. says, now my soul is troubled. Well, yeah, he's going to die a horrible death, right? And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Isn't that powerful? Do this to reveal your glory, Father. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And will glorify it again. And the crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. And now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, listen to this, when I am lifted up from the earth. What does that mean? on the cross, will draw all people to myself. It even goes on to say, he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. That's powerful. It's a powerful, powerful statement about God and his plan of salvation for us. So Satan is thinking he's got a victory. Jesus is dead. That's why he's still in the party. The problem was he had to have forgotten what God said. You're just going to bruise him, Satan. He is going to crush you. So Satan's head was crushed. His demons were disarmed. And his power was broken. Let's talk about that power for just a minute here. The power of Satan. I was talking about this with Pastor Stephen before, and, and Kevin, my brother-in-law at home, was like, what do you think the greatest power is that, that Satan has, has over us that causes doubt, that causes doubt? And um, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. 
Hebrews chapter 2. It'll be on the screen up there for you. Um, And in Hebrews chapter 2, it tells us exactly uh, what it is. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is the devil, right? That's the power that the devil had because the devil is the one that caused it. It goes on to say in verse 15, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by what? Say it. Their fear of of death. That is a lie. That's a lie. And every time we fear death, that's Satan. That's Satan telling us, you know what, there's nothing after this, or you may not make it to heaven, or whatever, you know, fearing death. So what did the cross mean to Satan? Jesus died him in victory. But then he rose, and now it means defeat. So then what does that mean for you and me? What does the cross of Jesus then mean for us? I think two things in particular. Number one, we don't need to fear death. I mean, sooner or later, we're all going to die, one way or another. But Jesus changed the meaning of what it means to die, of death for those who believe in him. If you look up 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, he took the sting out of death. It doesn't harm us anymore. So that while we still die, we will rise to live with him forever, just as God originally planned. He has given us victory over sin, over death, over hell, and over the devil himself. In fact, I want to say something here that I, I, don't, I don't say this very often. I said it last service, but I, I don't even know if I've ever said it here it, from this pulpit. But, but I believe this completely. It is impossible for a child of God, someone who believes in Jesus Christ, to go to hell. Impossible. It cannot happen. It will not happen. You believe in Jesus You're going to heaven. Because the work of salvation is absolutely complete. And when we look at that cross, wherever that might be, we say, thank you, Jesus. Second thing. The devil, though roaming around seeking people to devour. You know, I... I, I've always been intrigued by that concept as well. And many of you have heard me say this before that one of my favorite passages in Scripture that helps to keep me humble is the 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 that says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might lift you up in due time instead of you trying to lift yourself up, you know? Just wait, let him lift you up in his time, due time. That's what that means. And casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That precedes the next statement where he says because the devil is like a a lion, a prowling lion seeking someone to devour. And if you go back to the Genesis, it all ties together. You go back to Genesis and he cursed the snake and he crawled on your belly and eat dust. And what are we made of? Dust. And what does he say the lion, the snake is, or the snake, the lion, Satan is doing? He's prowling around looking for someone to devour. However, he also makes it clear that he can't hurt us when we trust in Jesus. You know, I don't know why God let Satan out on bail for a time. I I don't know that, and I, I oftentimes wish he hadn't. But I do know he uses Satan. He uses the evil in this world. He uses the troubles that we have in this world to make us stronger. Sometimes that's hard to accept. But I believe if we wait long enough and have the right perspective and open our eyes and, you know, to God's work and to his promises, he'll reveal it to us. He'll reveal those blessings out of difficult times in our lives. The reality is all the enemies of God are no more. They've all been defeated because they know what's coming And you know, this is what I love about the Bible. It's the only book 
I like to read because I know the ending first. I know how it's going to go. You know how it's going to go. I hate that when they do that to a Ludlum novel or something like that, but I mean to the, the Bible, I know the ending. And that's what you and I have, have got to hold on to. I, I love the story of Charles Spurgeon. He was a, a great preacher out of London in the 1800s. And he says he woke up one night because he felt that the bed was shaking. So he looks up out the window to see if there was a storm outside, and it was, it was clear. So he looks at the foot of the bed, and he sees Satan shaking his bed. And this is what he says. I looked at him, and I said, oh, it's only you. And I rolled over and went back to sleep. <laughs> it's like Spurgeon is saying that we all need to learn to say when doubt starts coming and when you start feeling discouraged and like like Jesus can't forgive you you say Satan you got nothing because I got Jesus because I got Jesus and I can preach that and we can say we believe that all we want but there are still some times I know in life when we feel pretty defeated and discouraged right there are just tough times when we we're tempted to give in to sin it's going to keep happening and sometimes we're going to question the ability of, of God through Jesus to forgive all of our sins because we know ourselves. And we're thinking, how is that even possible? But you know what? When we think that way, that's just Satan coming at us. That's what that is. That's where that guilt comes from because that got nailed to the cross. But so Satan, he, he comes at us and he, he came at me for months over and over again and again. I kept, I kept talking to God and said, God, would you please just tell Satan to get behind me? Because, <laughs> man. But he's going to keep coming at me. He's going to keep coming at you. He's going to keep coming at you with temptations and you're going to fight it and you're going to struggle it. And sometimes you're going to give in. And so he's going to come at you again and, and, and you're going to fight it. You're going to struggle with it. And you're going to give in. And then he's going to come at you again, and, and you're going to fight it, and you're going to struggle in it, and then you're going to give in. But you don't give up. You don't give up. Because it's not about your sin. It's about your Savior. And you know what we ought to be saying to Satan whenever he gets in our way? Hey, Satan, go to hell because that's where you belong because it's not about my sin it's about my savior and I claim victory over death over sin over you Satan because of what Jesus did for me on that cross the victory he won for me on that cross and from that grave the same victory Satan that you first heard when he descended into hell and showed up at that party, your party, uninvited and whispered one word in your ear. Gotcha. You know, next time you look at a cross, think about that. And just say that. Hey, Satan. Gotcha. In Jesus' name, amen.